<laughs> Let's do the Unlord to feeling in a little bit. Unloved, isolated, lonely, scared, angry, worried. Do me yeah. something in, in, not inspirational, Motiv motivation. Without sounding cheesy. Mo yeah. 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 Guys, you're a letting agent. Of course you'd say that. Yeah. Do people say that? But if, I'm a landlord and I'm still buying. And I, the hive mind of all of our landlords coming through, landlords yeah. are all trying to grow. And this is, this is something that comes up. We, we call it getting over the hump. Experience what I would call professional landlords established, care about all the noise. Um, Avoid the shiny pen, penny syndrome. Right. Delete all the news apps on your um, <laughs> on your phone. Make your own mind up. Plough your own furrow. How many times have been interested in this for years, forever? What do the landlords that go past 5, 10, 15, 20 properties, what do they all have in common? They just, they've got conviction of purpose and it comes from a number of different things. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Adam as always. This is Jess. Hello. Um, it's Monday, so we're recording our weekly video, and um, it's not a question today. I don't need that. Um, More of an observation. It's hey. an observation. Mm. Something that I've spotted, you spotted a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we think landlords are feeling a little bit unloved, isolated, lonely, scared, angry, worried, yeah. amongst a handful of other um, mm -hmm. really positive adjectives. Um, are they adjectives? Yeah. Um, I think so. Something English, like that. not my strong point. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, I don't know. We wanted to record a you, bit you of a positive video. Adam, Adam came to me and said, "Do me yeah. something in, in not inspirational, Motiv motivation, without sounding cheesy." Mo yeah. yeah. Um, because mm. we're not any of those things. Because yep. we're, I don't know, in it every day, um, speaking to lots of landlords every day. You know, I can sound off on get ideas off Jess whenever I want. Um, a lot of our clients only have us to talk to or they watch some of the videos and other people's content and then um, just get scared by the news and other stuff. Yeah, I think it's a bit isolated being a landlord. Personally, I've got a conviction of a, of a vision. I know, I know where I'm going. I've been doing it long enough now to know that it works. All those feelings I've been through myself, I'm generally quite a positive person. And I always look at the, the, the best way to do things or come, you know, approach something. So you look at it, something, if something's got a negative slant to it, you can always find the positive slant to exactly mm. the same situation if you come at it from a different angle. I think we've built a business that's like that and it's resilient and it talks to our customers and to our landlords and would-be landlords in the same way. Um, so hopefully that rubs off. Um, it definitely something you know, gets leveled at us sometimes, you know. If we keep saying, buy to let's brilliant, more buy to let, more buy to let, you know, Guys, you're a letting agent. Of course, you'd say that. Yeah. Do people say that? But I'm a landlord, and I'm still buying. And, I, and Adam's the same, yeah. and he's still buying. This so, so this isn't sort of a, a sales pitch or a, you know, um, just just keep being evangelical just for the sake of it. I recognise what's going on in the wider market, and when we're talking to the you know, the hive mind of all of our landlords coming through on comments, not just on YouTube. You'll, you'll look through some of those. Actually, they're all pretty pretty positive on on uh, in terms of the comments that come back from would be landlords. But we see would be landlords regularly on a one-to-one -one or a phone call, those kind of things. And some of the things that come back there, landlords are, are worried about certain stuff. Also, we've got a, a, a group of landlords, or, well, always several different cohorts going through of landlords who started from zero or low numbers and they're going through, you know, buying one, two, three, four, <coughs> five properties, 10, 15, 20 properties. So, you know, our landlords yeah. are all trying to grow. And this is this is something that comes up. We, we call it getting over the hump. And I've noticed the theme mm -hmm. amongst the, the people out there who are, you know, those words I described at the start, displaying a lot of those things, the really experienced, what I would call professional landlords, established maybe is a better word, that have that large portfolio. They don't care about anything else. They don't care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They don't care about all the noise. Um, I've got a guy I was talking to today who's got double figures, wants to keep going, doesn't care about any, any of the, the noise in the, mm -hmm. the news, anything like that. He's, just, he's not interested. He's got his business and he's got his property thing and he just wants to keep building. Um, and that's really common. Yeah, amongst those. That amongst those, those portfolio those. established yeah. landlords. The yeah. ones who are displaying all the, the more of the negative worries and everything else are got one or two, three or four. Mm -hmm. um, it's understandable. So mainly um, based down south, and yep. thinking that the whole of the property market is one market, which we've said before, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Things that you see in down south, 
aren't happening where we are. You know, property prices haven't dipped or stagnated at all in, where, in the areas where we buy. So, um, so there's I, lots to be positive about. I think landlords need to avoid the shiny pen, penny syndrome. You delete all your news apps. If you haven't done it already, don't watch the news. Delete all the news apps on your, um, <laughs> on your phone. Nev never join all those property WhatsApp groups. Silence them. Make your own mind up. Plow your own furrow. How many times have we say in this business? Plow your own furrow and get really interested in. We get interested in this. I'm personally, I've been interested in this for years, forever. What do the landlords that go past five, ten, fifteen, twenty properties? What do they all have in common? Exactly as Adam says, mm. that's probably the common denominator. It's not that they're ignorant or blinkered or shut it out they just they've got conviction of purpose and it comes from a number of different things um but yeah we call it getting over the hump know where you're going know that this works i've written i've written a few little bullet points down and uh, i'm going to sort of take them in in slightly different order than i've written them down here but um yeah i get this idea that landlords are feeling a little bit like they need a bit of gene up uh, and not everyone. No, no of course just... not everyone. It's, it's the ones that we need to get over the hump. Yeah, like, come on, yeah. you, you can do this, you can do this. I think, how about if I start off with saying why it's worthwhile doing it? And there's something that I've always subscribed to this idea. I mean, this is something that um, I, I've just heard it throughout my life. <coughs> the Dalai Lama said a version of this. I wanted to say the Dalai Lama. He's in Nottingham. Oh, really? Yeah, I did, yeah. It was okay. quite a few years ago. And um, yeah, you can only. What did be... he have to say about by tonight? Wasn't specifically directly <laughs> at by to let, to be honest. Yeah, he was. Yeah, you can only be so happy. That was the, mm. one of the things. Is you can only be so happy. This isn't actually. This is a little bit of a side mm. tangent. You know, you only get. You can only literally. You you got a, late, a, blat, a, a latent level of, of of happiness, and things will make you above that. You'll be elated, but then you sink back down. So it's down to you to work out how happy you're going to be. But something that I I genuinely has made me happier over my life. And it's not that money's the um, the. Um, the be all and the end all at all, but this this, this thing. It, um, I haven't read a book once. Um, a couple of different economic theories about the uh, what would they call it? The ever decreasing utility of uh, it's the it's the wine. I've done a you know the wine the wine bottle thing. Mm. So if you buy a bottle of wine for five pounds, there it is. If you upgrade that five pound bottle of wine to a twenty pound bottle of wine, you notice the difference. It's a big difference. You might not know that a, a bottle of wine it costs a pa uh, five pounds to get the bottle, and if you just had water in it, it'd be five pounds. So basically, the wine's free if you buy a buy five pound bottle of wine. A twenty pound bottle of wine, the wine the winemaker got to spend fifteen pounds on making it. It's good. Um, if you keep going up, keeping going up, you notice less and less the difference. If you buy a two hundred pound bottle of wine, you probably wouldn't notice the difference as as dramatically as between five and twenty. Um, Bill Gates talks about the uh, you can't buy a better hamburger. So somebody asked him, it was it's a you can you can um, you know, YouTube it. Not yeah, finish this video. But um, <laughs> yeah, some somebody in an audience, I think it was at Stanford, said, "How do I get to be as rich as you?" And he said, "After a certain point, wealth is just a number. You can't buy a better hamburger." So um, I remember a really good. Book uh, 88, The Narrow Road, written by Felix Dennis, the same thing. He said, you know, if, if I had my life again, um, I would race as quick as I can to, I think he's put it down to five million pounds at that point, race as quick as I can. He ended up with eight, nine hundred million pounds before he died, very rich man. I'd race to five million pounds and I'd stop because after that point, life didn't change that much. It got a bit more complicated with loads of money actually. So plough your own furrow, know your own number. But here's, here's the thing, here's the motivational thing for everybody listening. You're really close. You are really close without knowing it. The difference between the five pound bottle of wine and the 20 pound bottle of wine, getting the best hamburger you can get, you're that far away and everybody is. Um, the, the number that always stands out for me is 95% of the UK's population I don't know why I mentioned this in the last couple of but in the last couple of weeks. I don't know if I was on a video or we're talking. 95% of the UK's population earn £80,000 or less. And there's a huge amount. That's everybody, yeah? So from zero, mm. I think actually it doesn't include zero. You've got to be earning. That's the whole point. You've got to be earning to be included in the stats. So um, you can be stacking shelves in a supermarket very part-time as a student and you're included in that list. And maybe that's £8,000 a year. All the way up to £80,000 a year, et cetera, et cetera. Now... 
talking about the diminishing returns and the, uh, the, the bottle of wine and you can't buy a better hamburger, of course, all life is geared up to those 95% of people. So anybody who goes to work, you would struggle to spend more than or, or, or decrease the cost of any particular item by much more than sort of 10, 10 times, 8,000 pounds to 80,000 pounds, 10 times. You know, what's the most you can spend on um, a sandwich at lunch? You know, two pounds? Sorry, the least, least, two yeah, quid, two, two quid. quid yeah. The most, 20 quid. I mean, of course, I think the most expensive sandwich in the world was thousands of pounds because it was for charity, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And there's always outliers, but generally in general life, you don't need a better hamburger. You know, what's the, what's the, cheapest, what's the cheapest car you can buy? 10 grand, most expensive car. Hundred grand, of course. There's million pound cars. They're not cars. They're not an A to B car. They. But you drive into um, what's a cheap car? A Fiat Garage. You know, cheapest cheapest little run around car. Ten grand. You drive into you know, BMW, Audi, Mercedes. The most expensive, pretty much. I know you can go maybe 150, but 100. It's roughly in that range, isn't it? Why does that matter? Because if you can get just a little bit ahead, then you are ahead, and it makes a massive, massive difference because everything you've got is free and clear. Now, why is that? something worth you know, being motivated about, every landlord has got it in their power to just do that extra little bit. I know it's a pain in the arse sometimes, and we call it getting over the hump. You get the, the one, two, three, four, five properties. It's hard work. It's, 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 uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like it's coming quick <clears> enough. <throat> it feels like um, you get a few knockbacks, and it feels disproportionately hard getting that yeah, knockback. You, know, you, get, you get one landlord with a house that doesn't rent you know, a couple of weeks, or. The, the roof has a leak or it's like, oh my God, you know, it's a big, big deal. Those emails come in for me now once or twice a month. It's just not a big deal. And, and in terms of percentage, I get to see it's not a big deal, not because I can, well, I suppose it is also because I can deal with it. I've got systems, I've got processes, I've got the money in the bank to actually fix it. So don't, don't cut yourself too fine. That's one of the things, have yeah, a definitely. buffer. Definitely always have a buffer. But then they don't come in very, very often. It's like, you, you can see if they all came in the very first month or first year of ownership even, that would be hard to stomach, but they're just very infrequent, actually, in the grand scheme of things, even if they happen to me with more houses once or twice a month. So getting landlords over the hump, you've got to put up with quite a bit in the first couple of years while you're building, but as soon as you go over that little bit, as soon as you can upgrade from a £5 bottle of wine to a £20 bottle of wine, life feels a whole lot different. And after that, actually, you don't need to don't need much more. I mean, you can, you can, you can be greedy like me and want more, but you don't need much more. I think the um, thing is as well is um, just try not to get too caught up in all the noise. Mm -hmm. So chatting to someone and about buying in that <clears throat> crash, just 2008, nine. And if you bought slight, just before that crash and slowing that house now, you'd be well happy with it. Yep. Well happy with how much it's gone up in value. <clears throat> if you waited until 2012, 13 to start buying again. You were paying more than what you were immediately after the crash. Mm -hmm. And you're into this for the long term. So why worry about what's happening in the here and now in the short term stuff? Yeah. If you're buying something that yeah. you're just going to hold forever or 20 years, 30 years, anyway, who cares? Tell, tell us that story. Um, it came in over the weekend or even today. A landlord who got, I don't know the figures, expensive house and it wasn't working. And immediately Adam said, because oh, he's paying too much tax. Mm. Now well, he's a high rate taxpayer. He yeah. owns a really expensive house, 600 grand. Most of it's got equity. So, might, you know, his mortgage is 200K mm. loan, um, 400K equity. So he's making 2K a year. Yeah. After rubbish. he's done his self assessment and it's all in his own name and he's not getting mortgage tax relief anymore. So his buy set doesn't work. He's just got the wrong house yeah. and he structured it wrong. It's not in a limited company. He could have 10 houses with or more, 20 houses, whatever. He could have a hell of a lot more houses and be making a lot more money yeah. instead of just having that one expensive house. I, I hear a lot from landlords, buy to let doesn't work. And looking at their situation every single time, no, buy to let doesn't work for you because you're mm. doing it wrong. You're doing it yeah. wrong. Um, another, another thing that's definitely worth always remembering is because lots of landlords checked out on this. In, in, the, in the era of cheap money, landlords checked out on capital, capital growth as a, as a, you know, they're all focused on income, 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 because you could, because the, um, the, the mortgage was ne negligible, next to nothing in terms of what, what it was costing every month. Don't forget that the biggest gain you'll ever make is your capital gain. So when you're talking about property success, whether this has been a success or failure to you, 
always think of total property return, capital growth plus income. Because mm. actually, when you look at it, that guy's, it's not brilliant, I would have done something different, but he made good capital he return over the last 10 yeah. years. So, but he's kind of forgotten about that. And you know, How many times have we found a landlord, got a bit fed up with paying too much tax? Again, you know, just get that sorted out, guys. Go go and get, get your limited company sorted out, get some advice. Um, get, get Got a bit fed up with a, one particular tenant or some situation, and they said, oh, I'll just sell up. And they're, they're, one of the things, the things in the back of their mind is selling, they're going, my house has gone up in value. And I've seen it a couple of times mm. in the last couple of months where a landlord's got impatient, I'd put it that way, not even fed up, just impatient, and notice how much value the house has gained in the last five, six, seven years and decided to sell up to get the money and so what, what on earth are you going to do with that money? Because no, exactly. where else are you going to put it? Look, look, the reason you're attracted to selling it is because it's just gone up in value. Why don't you do that again? Why not refinance it at that higher price, take that equity and start to put it into another investment that's going to do the same thing again over the next six to seven years. Get that advice. Get, get, get in touch with the mortgage broker. Get in touch with um, Adam and see what other houses are, are available and around. So, um, yeah, is that inspirational enough? Well, we'll find out. Well, we need to put some in the comments. And normally we don't do that kind of stuff, do we? But it's um, more kind of nuts and bolts. Um, this is what you do, how you do it. But that's a little no, bit I, of an insight I, into my mind. That's that's how I how I work. It is true for a lot of people that they do find it a lonely business. Yeah. You know, you, you, who else you talk to, and if your mates aren't doing it as well, or you know, some people you know. So it's nice mm. that we're here for that. Yeah. Good. So summary: three things. Get conviction of thought yourself. Plow your own furrow. Feel like you know what you're doing. You've got conviction. You know where you're heading. Know the total property return, capital growth plus income, because you add those both things together. When the markets are doing this, usually when one thing's going up, the other thing's going down and vice versa. If you only by adding your capital growth to your P&L, will you actually come up with the total property return? And then the third thing is get interested in what landlords who make a success of it are doing. Landlords who own Good five, point. 10, 15, 20 properties. And I can tell you now, they're not worrying about any of the things that the landlords with one or two properties are thinking about. Obviously, they're just not. That's why they've got to that point, and it's why they're carrying on, pushing on. So um, get interested in what landlords with more properties than you are doing. Cool. Cool. Thanks very much. All right. Um, like and subscribe. Like, All subscribe, thumbs up. See you next week. Bye for now. Cheers.